Hey guys, what's going on? Ruby Nation here. This is Admin Wilt, and I am joined today by Admins Rin. Yo. Yatsuhashi. Hey. Mercury. Hello there. And Melodic Cudgel. Greetings, lackeys. All right, guys, so today we've got Volume 4, Episode 3 of Runaways and Stowaways. Overall, I thought a very nice episode. We got some action, we got some feels, we got some story progression. What are all your guys' opening thoughts about the episode? Sun Let's lost go. his abs. <laughs> <laughs> and this triggers me to no end. Um, Black Sun becomes more and more canon as the season goes on, and I'm really upset over it. But <laughs> I, can, I can second that. And I also feel really, really sad for Yang. Yeah... I knew this was going to happen, though. I knew it was going to be, like, some post-traumatic I, I, I stress. Just, I, I, I would just like to say that I, I, I called the thing with Ironwood. <laughs> Sending her an arm? Yeah, I, I, me and uh, our former Cinder, actually, had talked about this at the end of Volume 3, and that was one of the things. I was like, Got watch. It. I was like, watch. Right. He's going to give her an arm. And he did. Can I have one more thing real quick about opening thoughts? Yeah, um, I don't see Black Sun happening because um, we, I'm getting a very big nice guy feel out of this, and I have the feeling that she's going to end up letting him down. Okay. I also want to say that the fight with the Grim, but it made sense up until a group in wings. <laughs> oh, sorry, okay, okay listen, wings. listen, listen. You're looking for sense. In Ruby, <laughs> I think a Grim can be anything. It can have any type of like I mean, modifications it wants. <laughs> when you consider that last week they gave us a Golem Grim that actually turned out to be a Poltergeist Grim, but you know. Exactly. So I feel like the wings was fine. I feel like it added danger to the aspect. Wings so. on anything adds danger to anything. Think of a spider. Well, that's fine. Oh, no, I don't want to talk flying... about flying spiders. No thanks. <laughs> flying spider Grim. There we go. All right, well, in the sort of the opening scene, we get to see Blake out on the boat. Um, and she is not looking too happy. She's got a very just distressed look on her face. And then we later find out that she's starting to almost suffer from a type of PTSD from everything that's happened. She's worried about everything. She's paranoid, even to the point where it's like she just doesn't want to be around anybody. And when you first saw Blake this season, what is the first thing that came to your guys' heads? I would have to say, you know, what, particularly the instance where she inter and how she interacted with a captain. Uh, I was sitting there, you know, I thought to myself when, when she when she went, she kind of, you know, sat there and kind of snapped at him. I was like, Jesus, Blake, he's just trying to be. <laughs> you know, I was like, oh God, calm down. It's not that serious. I think it's because she doesn't want to get close to anyone anymore. Yeah, I think with Yang. Yeah, first with Adam and then Yang, she doesn't want to keep being broken down from I all mean, this crap. I mean, she's in a constant state of not feeling safe. Like, she literally always has to look behind her back to see if Adam's chasing her, and nowhere safe. People around her aren't safe. So yeah, it makes sense that she'd want to be alone, and she was exactly the way I expected her to be seeing her this episode. <laughs> I like the captain myself. Although, you'd think he'd be um, old enough to know better than to jinx the journey by saying, oh, yeah, it's going to be boring. Yeah, he summoned the Grim. But when I think he... it was Blake's negativity. Yeah, when she saw it, which, which, we could, which I think we can all agree that was Sun standing up there looking at her. But, <laughs> yeah, well, it was you confirmed know. later then, so... It was already there, though. Like the, It was already following the boat. I think maybe that little spike of negativity just made an attack. I don't know. But it was it, the fins were shown before it, um, when it before it, Sun was even revealed. <laughs> but the, you know, the captain, though, that's the thing. It's like, you notice she goes for the weapon. He doesn't um, react to anything else like that. He has his hands up. This is a man who's dealt with Huntsman before has seen them being really stressed out and he's just um you know checking in and making sure that his passengers will be safe well I agree. One, other, one other thing that we actually saw from the from blake's intro is that she is basically going bowless now uh she's she's headed back home she doesn't feel like she needs it anymore 
And do you guys think this is the smartest move on Blake's end? I think it was an impulse thing, or she feels that she's condemned to this decision and she can't, like, she won't change it or nothing can change it. <laughs> where, where I'm kind of sitting with it, too, is that perhaps she's realized that no matter what she does, she can't run forever. I mean, you can only run for so long before everything eventually catches up with you. And I think, you know, again, it goes back to Volume 3 and Adam finding her. As well as, you know, all that, the events that took place then as well. There's a lot of that there, too. Okay. Do you, do you remember when she was talking to Ozpin after um, they had the scene with the chair and everything else like that? And that made it look like jail bars. And he asked why she um, hid what she was. And she said that she wanted people not to react to her because she was a faunus. Well, she's going into an area where she doesn't have to hide who or what she is. She is not ashamed of being a faunus. So she doesn't have to worry about what other people think about her, especially when she's going back to Menagerie. Okay, yeah, so Menagerie sounds saying... very pro, pro, yeah. um, it's I mean, she said she was going back home. She's odds are, um, based on the intro sequence, we could finally, uh, don't know how soon, but maybe see her family. Uh, hopefully, here in the next couple episodes, we don't know how long they're going to be on the boat. Um, but I'm, I'm agreeing with Melodic on this one. I think it's mostly because it's a, a fact of she's, she's comfortable again with where she's going. She doesn't feel like she has to hide. It may also be like she she is done running but i'm i'm not sure if that's the case she's she knows she's still being followed so it's i don't she know if she's say done she running would. but i do think it is because like she with or without the bow it doesn't affect anything anymore i think she looks better without the bow that's my vote i, I do think she looks better without the bow and i like the animation of the cat ears i thought that was great and i couldn't stop watching them the entire episode <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's like I said earlier, I, I, I definitely don't think that, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, I think she's realized, because when you think about it, the, the bow really didn't stop anybody from finding out what she was <laughs> in the first place. I mean, it's literally... I like was able to see right through it somehow. Mm -hmm. If I was to just be on a completely technical level, I would say that she's forsaken the bow because Rooster Teeth has gotten to the point in its animation where they can effectively do the cat ears. <laughs> okay. So you think it's a, a technical choice? <laughs> They're like, finally, we can remove this stupid ball. <laughs> <laughs> yep. It, anything's a possibility at this stage. You, you, you think you think the Monty was just sitting there like, what would he design? Like, he's like, ah, can't, we, we can't animate these ears, can we? All right, just put a bow on her. <laughs> We'll figure it out later. <laughs> Turned it into great character development. <laughs> Monty, you've been up for 78 hours. You need to stop trying to animate those ears. <laughs> I'm on my 10th cup of coffee. Don't bother me now. <laughs> Truth. <laughs> well, uh, shortly after that, um, we see the sun is setting. And <laughs> the and we, we brought it up a little bit ago, but the cloaked figure did end up being a character that most of us had sort of seen coming um but it did end up to be sun what was your first thoughts when he just sort of like bust out and just starts attacking this huge sea dragon groom i was blake in the last scene after they kill the dragon i wanted to smack the out of him <laughs> <laughs> that's who i was that was my reaction i, I was just sitting there like i knew i knew he was hiding on that ship I think we all went into the episode, like, because we watched the intro, obviously. We all went into the episode on the boat. We're all just kind of standing there like, where the f*** is son? I don't know where yeah. he is. <laughs> <laughs> so we, he was pulling we off his Obi-Wan cosplay. Son at that point, then. Yeah, I, yeah, I was pretty confident. Like, I'm just basing off the intro. Like, he's somewhere on the boat. He's probably going to be right there. And then, like, the first time you see him... With the cloak on, it's like, okay, that's obviously him. If he's just staring menacingly, menacing at Lee at the Bella booty. <laughs> I mean, who else would do that besides Zang? And she's in Patch, so. Uh... 
Well, I mean, the um, only thing, another thing with him too, though, you notice that, you notice the, he got the reasoning for why she was doing this entirely wrong. I thought that was hilarious. That was great. Oh, it was, it was a beautiful moment. Did you just see? It's like, you're you know, wrong, son. You're he so wrong. It. And then one woman rampage against the white fang, and her ears go, idiot. Ugh. Like her face at that, like. What? That was the best. That face needs to become a meme. It was uncomfortable for me. <laughs> I felt it was a really uncomfortable situation. I was like, you're a freaking idiot. A slap again. This Man, is... well, you're, yeah, well, you're pro Bumblebee, so you know what. Okay, we're not going to talk about that yet. We can talk about that <laughs> if it comes up. <laughs> okay. You, you and I know we're both on the same ship. Uh -huh. Okay, I, you know, I'm... You know, I will say that I am not fond of Sun. But that's because I see myself in him back when I was younger and less cynical. He's chasing after someone who's nice to him and not telling him to push off, or at least not recently. And so he seems to be of the opinion that if he's persistently nice to her, she will fall for him. And that kind of has a tendency to leave the people with I her. mean, it, it, though, when you go back as far as Volume 1, there was kind of groundwork in place. There, there is. They do... They do oh, like each other. I know they do, and it. I don't want to admit it, but they definitely have. A, there's a thing there. I know. Looking at it, looking at this past episode, she was obviously mad that he followed her, who wouldn't be in her situation. But in a yeah, way, I, I maybe think, she's happy that he's there. Maybe. I, I think. I think part of the reason why she's mad at him for being there is because her whole idea of getting away from Team Ruby and you know about at, after the events of Volume Three was she didn't want anybody else to get hurt. Yeah, I wanted to protect her. them. Yeah. Yes. So I think that's part of the reason she's angry with him is because he's put himself effectively in danger by following her. Does that give Son a red shirt now because he is now possibly in danger and a meet up with Adam might be on the on the on the horizon I'm eventually? I'm curious to see how well, how I... a fight would go between the two of them. I he don't think his assuming well. Blake just doesn't pull his son away. He just, held his own okay. pretty well. Like, I mean, I done. don't. I don't think that I don't think it's going to be just one of them fighting him and winning. I think it's going to take multiple people. I was hoping it would be Yang and Yang and Blake fighting him together. Well, but... it could lead up to it. Like maybe Sun gets split up from Blake in a desert scene in the intro. Maybe like that's possible. And then Volume Five, it's possible her Yang and Sun all fight Adam at once. Well, they need a rematch. That uh, that that's a rematch that needs to happen. <laughs> If they don't do it, they're going to get yelled at by literally the whole fandom. I'm pretty yeah. sure. I'm pretty sure they're smart enough to do it. I just don't know when it's going to happen or how it's going to get up to that point. Well, going from there, we get the the big fight between Blake, Sun, all of the the crewmen against the brand new monstrous sea dragon Grim that to me just looks so cool. Yeah, I agree. Uh, part, the damn wings. breathing wing grim serpent that was pretty damn awesome can i talk about how can i talk about how i saw a vine where someone inserted rayquaza's like pokemon <laughs> voice over it as it appeared i saw and, it oh, i saw I it i need to find this i have not seen I it i saw it have to look and uh you have to send that link to me i need that <laughs> i saw it and, uh, i saw it and my first my first reaction was what the Grim Gyarados? <laughs> That's what I thought too. I thought it would be Gyarados. Well, it's but... more of it's better than Gyarados. It actually can fly. True. Well, uh, wait, Gar Gyarados? We had four minutes and uh, fifteen seconds of fight. That was thirty percent of the episode, not counting the opening and ending credits. I loved it. I feel, I don't know. I just I've loved that the fight so far. I think that was a good reintroduction to Blake, though, with with that with that whole fight. That that was like you know. I love like the it's... semblance. I love that her semblance gave her a boost. That was just so awesome. That shows that she's leveled it up since. Like, it's it's definitely yeah. better now. Because before, it was just an immobile shadow that took the hit for her. Now it actually acts. But, like, it, do you think that maybe it's, like, a little too similar to Suns? Because I know Suns is, like, aura clones. But I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how to differ differentiate the two. Often. Suns are made out of pure energy. I think Blakes are actually now, like, physically capable of doing things. Like shadow clones, like, like Naruto. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we've seen her mix her shadow clones with dust before to create different elements, like the stone statue 
um, that yes. she leaves behind and yeah. things like that. So that this may just be a continuation of that, um, using it as a, a solid surface to propel herself from. Um, but speaking of both of their semblances, we got to see them use it a ton in the fight um, against this Grim, who at the time, at first, seemed very, very resilient to just about anything they could throw at it. And then they they came up with this plan and we we got to see some some sun being sun and just being the goofball that he is during the fight and i thought this was this was one of those great moments where you get to see that that ruby is not going back to serious just yet it still is is throwing in the the humor and everything that we've always loved from it at the same time though we are seeing the mix between like volumes one and two's overall feel and then volume three seriousness finally combined uh in volume four and i think this episode really showed that well and so what are your guys' thoughts on on how they are treating this new volume i think it's great i think they found the balance that they need i feel like if it was too serious all the time it wouldn't feel like ruby but i also yeah. feel that if it wasn't serious enough it would feel like the last season had no had no like leverage yeah and yeah so, exactly like, exactly like if if basically if they had you know gone back to all shiri joking and all that mm -hmm. i feel like it would have just basically made like all the events of volume three just null and void because yes. it'd been like okay so that all happened and yet we're all still here just laughing and having you know having a good time that doesn't Add up. Okay. I will admit, Sun's like jokes and stuff kind of seemed just like really forced in, in my opinion. And there's like kind of like sticking out out of everything. I did not notice the same thing, but I guess I can understand like where mm -hmm. someone would come from when they said something like that. Like, it felt kind of forced in my opinion. It's just like they like, kind of shoved it in, and for me, it like threw the vibe of the episode off a little bit for me. I, I feel like that I might have been there. intentional. Like, that might have been intentional because he is like you have to capture his essence and his essence is not serious like at all like he like there's like there's rarely been a time where he's been all serious and yeah they were serious in the way they were fighting and everything but he needs to have that like little sun spark of humor here or it's just not him so maybe that's yeah. why it felt forced in my feeling you need to have a light in order to make the darker the darkness more intense so while you have the bits of humor like ruby in the previous episode teasing john before they come across all that devastation in john and her finding out about um, pira um, it wouldn't have been as devastating without the glimmer of light at the start and thus, with this episode, we are being given a glimpse of the light so that when they hit us with darkness, once again, it is going to be devastating. Okay. Well, going going in from that into the final point about about Blake's section of the, the episode, um, she's not happy Sun's there. It's fairly obvious. She goes right after the whole fight. She goes in for the big old slap across the face. Which Perfect. I, I laughed about for about five minutes straight when that happened because I was like, he deserves it, but yeah, the, she's stuck with him now. Yeah. He is on the boat after all. Mm -hmm. I agree. There's really no getting rid of him now unless he like somehow <laughs> dies. Help, but I couldn't help myself with that line. It's like, well, I'm, I'm here with you because I'm kind of already on the boat. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that line like... perfectly described, I think, just like. The, the moment where Blake just went from, oh, great, to, oh, crap, I am stuck with you. Uh, well, I have to say that um, he's going to bring some much-needed levity to Blake's um, situation. Because Blake's always been a fairly serious character on her own without her friends to draw her out. She needs a counterpoint, and you know, while we don't exactly like Sun, he is a character that will provide that counterpoint, and he actually has a legitimate reason for chasing after Blake, even if a lot of people would rather have Bumblebee happen. 
I would like to point out that I don't I don't dislike Sun as a character. I like him as a character. I just have a certain preference when it you, comes you to don't who. See him. I yes. agree with Yatsu completely on this matter. Like, I don't hate Sun as a character. In fact, I really like Sun as a character. And at one point, I really did ship them together and didn't have that much of a problem with it. You... But I, now I'm kind of, like, stuck. <laughs> yeah, it's. I think it's It's in the same boat along the lines of we want to see Sun as the, the best friend character, not necessarily the relationship character. Yes. Yeah, and maybe that's a little, like, biased on my part because a lot of people ship Black Sun. Mm -hmm. But, like, I, I don't know. I don't know. Ugh. That's the other thing. It's like, I do want this to end up being that she says, I'm not into you that way, and him accepting it. Because the stereotypical nice guy is someone who gets so upset that, you know, you're not into me, and doesn't give up, hoping. And it would be really nice to have a character, especially one who people consider immature or trivial in some ways, to accept this with dignity and grace it would be you know, I, if rooster teeth pulls that off i'll applaud them definitely all right well that that pretty much wraps up blake's part of the story for for this episode and then right from there we're going right into yang's side of the story and right when we see her she's doing what we all sort of expected she's she's sort of going into casual mode and she she's winded down from everything but she's still got that emotion heavily weighted on her and with all of that it's like we get to see what she's like during this this first section and it's a bit depressing honestly it, she basically lost any enjoyment in life it's yeah that's that what it dark. looks like like yeah that's what it looks like like i mean you know you see her sitting there scrolling through all the TVs and, it, you know, all the TV channels. And when she sees Adam's picture, you can clearly see, too, like, the effect it has on her. She kind of takes kind of like a closer look at the screen, realizes that's who it is. And you kind of you kind of see you kind of see her turn the TV off at that point or very shortly after. So she's clearly fighting the demons, so to speak. Yeah. Even when her dad comes home, she just sounds like a dead monotone voice yes i mean it's it's to be expected like i i would be very disappointed if she wasn't like this like this is what needed to happen you obviously anybody would have post-traumatic stress disorder after something like that and i'm actually surprised more of them aren't exhibiting signs of it like weiss and ruby seem to be like okay at least but then again they are tackling their own problems um am i the only one that doesn't want her to use the arm that ironwood sent her I, I want to see if she like actually. I, I don't I want her to. I think it would be great growth and great and a great symbol if she sh like deci decided that she didn't need it. it would well, another thing too that I'm another thing that I'm thinking with that, um, as far as that arm is concerned, I'm thinking that if she does use it, it'll be only after she's, you know what I mean? Yes. Overcome after everything. she's tried everything to do everything she can on her own before. Yeah. Okay. Know, just rather, to describe things, this is about Yang coping, but she's not coping very well. It's when I when I first saw the arm, the first thought that came to my head was they they went the the robotic arm route, and then they they sort of switched it up on me that like Yang didn't just immediately go for I give me put this on I'm ready to go, which is what. Like, a lot of people said that a lot of their theories were that she would get this robotic arm and that's how she was going to be from here on out. But instead, she, like you guys said, they're, they're taking the more, like, she is not ready to do this yet kind of approach. And maybe we'll, we'll see a comeback on the arm. Maybe it'll stay like this. We still am not sure because in the intro and in the um, pre-volume release images that they showed, they, they don't show her with that arm and so could it be that like she's going to be going on now with the with her missing arm or is she going to get something different or who knows but i think it was the right step for for her Kelly for that yeah, for her character development and i i'm really excited to see how this takes it but we got to see one last thing with yang and that was how she is almost worse off than Blake in her paranoia and like PTSD state 
Oh like, yeah. She, yeah. She is messed up right now. Like just a a thought of anything like makes her freeze up immediately. And this is not something that I would ever see or thought that I would see from Yang, like such a strong character. I like that she got angry at herself afterwards. But going back to the arm, you notice how the dad offers the arm? He puts it on the coffee table, but he leaves it closer to him than rather than putting it on in front of her. He's not pushing the arm on her. He offers it to her. She turns it away. He's not being pushy about it, which is what I like. He because wants you can't, to take the time. Yeah, but you can't you can't do that with somebody with post traumatic stress disorder. And she's showing she's exhibiting like high signs of post traumatic stress disorder. And what what tells you that is the fact where she's having flashbacks at like at like loud noises and things that startle her, and it sends her into like those fits. Like that is someone who is severely like mentally like hurt, and it's gonna take some time. In fact, I don't know when Yang will fully recover, but it's probably going to be like over the close to probably the entirety of this volume is it's is my guess okay i'm gonna see go. also, season five she'll start healing we'll see her still having the problems trying to fight through it but she's not going to start really starting to overcome it until season five okay i honestly don't think she's going to accept the arm regardless of it being presented to her what also makes me think that is that in the picture that was released for the volume four trailer, yeah, she, she doesn't have an arm. She has a nub on the end of it. So I don't know. I really would love to see her just be able to fight and handle herself with just one arm to show that that didn't like beat her. Like she just kind of can move past it. Maybe she should be awesome. taking lessons from the Malachites and actually give them a reason to have screen time. Maybe. <laughs> no, it'll be her dad teaching her. And um, we've already seen hints of that with the opening credits, so. Yeah, well, a guy can dream. Plus, they, those two twins have, like, aside from a minute appearance in Volume 2, have never had a reason to be shown on screen. Yeah. So, odds are we'll, we'll get to see more of the uh, odds are Yang's um, antagonist for this volume, uh, hopefully later on. Um, probably my prediction for that, uh, for Blake's or not Blake's Yang's story is that the fir this first half of the volume, it's going to be her against herself. And then like, I mentioned this during the last podcast, but then second half, then she's going to have to start like getting some stuff together because they're, they're not just going to be able to show just Yang in her depressed states. She's, she's got to build back up. She's got to just rebuild the character that we all knew as like at the time one of the strongest personalities in the show and i think she's gonna have to figure that out here in the next few episodes but what we are going to finish up with for the the storyline of this episode is we finished out with a meeting between cinder and salem and salem is going on to her about cinder's treatment and it gets weird Oh right. yeah, the creature, like the Grim Seer. Mm -hmm. That was like really odd. Um, although, I, I mean, Salem obviously isn't stupid. Like she knows something happened. I don't believe yeah. whether, like Cinder could say that she killed Ospin, but I don't know if it went the way she that we're thinking. I think that maybe she thinks she could have. But I don't think it was like, like a straight up death. Something and made it look like it. What my, what I think might have like happened, and I don't know like what Cinder could have saw to make her like feel like she needs to hide something from Salem. What if I know this has been said before, but what if Ozpin is like the wizard from the stories? And what if the wizard from the stories with the Maidens has kind of like the same life cycle as the Maidens, as the power of the wizard, or the, like, the embodiment of the wizard kind of moves on from person to person as, the per as they get deceased, or as they pass away, or whatever. That was my possible theory. Okay. I have um, one... Oh, sorry, if I'm interrupting anyone. No, go ahead. So... 
I agree with Yats on that. It's very po it is possible that the wizard's power does channel through that. But I'm what I'm thinking is so Osman's thing, like Osman's thing was always like clocks and stuff. He was in the clock tower the whole time. And when he fought Cinder in volume three, you can see like him super aggressively altering speed to deflect and attack her. Manipulating time, which would be yeah. his, a hint towards his semblance. <laughs> what I'm thinking is, it's possible that Cinder got into, they both got the fight, they got into a situation, and when it looked like Ozpin was about to die, he altered time to make it somehow think Cinder finished him off, but at the same time, his altering of time prevented him from actually dying. So, I don't think that could work, though. But, or she's purposely hiding the fact that she didn't end up be wasn't end up able, able to kill him, because you could tell, like, when she's asked about it, she looks very uncomfortable and doesn't know how to answer. And you could tell she's been asked this multiple times, and Salem's kind of getting, like, sick of the runaround. Yeah. <laughs> and we, we finish off with, um, between Cinder and Salem, with the, just... Cinder saying yes that she killed Ozpin and like my personal theory on Ozpin is that he didn't die but that he literally just disappeared and Cinder assumes he's dead but she honestly doesn't know but I really think like Ozpin literally just flat out disappeared because they're like if there was a body like there would Odds are there would have to be some kind of body to really be assumed dead. Like, if there was no Plus body, he... like, there's no way to really tell. Plus, you would think Salem would want the body as, like, a trophy or something. Definitely. And a <laughs> rim, that might be. See, like, I, I don't know, because, like, I thought she was, like, talking to Ozpin, and that was, like, you know how, like, in, the, in Volume 1, they're having a conversation. I thought that they were going to end up talking, she was going to have him somewhere, but it seems like she just thinks that he's dead, or is, is hoping that, is that really he's dead. That's a point to bring up, because another thing that I had always sort of thought ever since uh, the end of Volume 3 was that Salem knows Ozpin's fate. She, she knows, but she wants Cinder, like she, she wants to know if Cinder is telling her the truth or not. Cause she already knows and that's why she gets constantly angry with cinder when she's telling her yes but she knows the truth and i'm curious to see how this like this i don't know what to call it the the weird grim i guess I'm gonna call it, like it it looks like a crystal ball like at first when she brought it out i thought she was gonna look into it and like see things but then it, it started to show more like a, a medicine type object um, for Cinder's treatment. And I'm curious, like, because uh, Salem mentioned in the first episode that there there came a weakness to, to this. And I'm curious, like, what is going to happen to Cinder? And if this treatment has is going to bring something to the surface or not. So I'm curious what your guys' final thoughts on that are. Well, the crippling weakness that you spoke of had to do more with the power she had acquired. Not necessarily that the treatment was going to give her a crippling weakness. Okay. I I agree. I think it has to do with something with the maiden's power. I don't know what it exactly it would be or how the two, how the silver eyes are related to the maidens. I don't even know if it was just the power surge that did this to her, or if there actually was, like, an altercation after the scene cut, and that is how Ruby ended up taking her eye. Like, it just seems like it would be weird that a power surge would just randomly take your eye. It would feel, it would be more realistic if someone lost their eye, they would lose it in, like, a scuffle or, like, a fight. So well, did, like, Ruby and them burner. fight? Yeah, she, well, you also have to remember, too, that we can assume from her outfit that the in that entire half of her body is screwed up. True. Because she used to show a lot of skin. Let's 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 face it. Yes. She did, and yeah. now half her body is covered up, noticeably on the her... same side as her missing eye. It's only her arm that's really showing. 
is she wearing a mask or when you when you look at a certain shot when she's at the table like i know this goes back to episode one but like we're talking about it as it relates to episode three so in certain scenes you can kind of see it looks her her eye or the area around her eye looks as though she's either a wearing a mask or it looks as though she's kind of been turned to like like for like stone much like the dragon was at the top of the tower like okay. it looks like that same material on her face so did it like it did it like burn her to the like did it does it did it turn part of her to like stone i don't know what it did i didn't yeah, consider it as stone actually i just thought it was a patch like yeah, I, it looks to me it looks more like a mask or an eye patch or something yeah, and that's what I thought too. And like maybe she's just covering up the fact that she's missing, obviously, her eye. But like I also like looked at like the dragon in certain in like the in the opening cutscene, and it is in fact turned to like stone, like in, in the intro. So I just didn't know if maybe like that's 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 part of it's what possible. it was. That's a good catch. I've speculated that um, the silver eyes are a form of anti magic. And thus it disrupts the Grim because the Grim are creatures of magic and it would thus hurt the Maidens because they also are beings of magic. But are Grimm's beings of magic though? We don't know how like... they be, how they are created or why they even exist and what they... Well, what they're... We just know they hunt down humans and it's a known the negative fact. emotions. It's a known fact that Silver Eyes definitely affects Grimm. Oh yeah, absolutely. I just don't know if it's because they are magic per se, just because we don't really know much about why the Grimms exist. Like, so they... it's quite possible that, you know, this is also something that could be a greater power than even the Maidens, hence why it did what it did to Cinder. Her That's true. Some of the Maidens' power. You know, it, it's quite possible that because she possessed that power, she became susceptible to it. Okay. True. All right. Well, just... we're gonna finish up with some predictions and theories. So, from this episode, uh, I'm gonna get each of your sort of predictions and theories on what we're going to see maybe in the next episode and the rest of the volume. So, I'm gonna start uh, with Rin on this one and then go down the line. All right. Well, my prediction, what I see happening is more than more than certainly we're gonna de probably end up seeing blake's family we're gonna probably as uh you know a lot of can merc suggested earlier and i believe yatsu was also part of that conversation uh we're probably gonna see you know yang training with her father training with Taiyang, you know trying to get the hang of things with one arm you know if she I, i'm thinking if she does use that arm it might be for looks only and when it comes to combat, she might just take the thing off. I, I don't know. That, I mean, that could be a thing. But hey, um, you know, with Ruby and and the, what remains of Juniper, uh, you know, I, I I could see. Obviously, they're gonna be at Mistral by the time the volume is over. They're on their way there. You know, we've only been three episodes in so far. And each time they're getting a little closer. Though obviously this most recent episode didn't really highlight them much, if at all. And uh, I could see, you know, by the end of the volume they get there and pro probably have to start dealing with things that are occurring there and, you know, potential issues, potential, you know, plots and whatnot that might have been set in place by the villains and what have you. But so far, that's, that's, that's what I can see. Okay. And uh, Yatsu, what about you? Any predictions or theories? Um, prediction one. I obviously I think Yang is gonna start to like train or get there somehow. I think that her moment of clarity, where she finally like finds a way to ground herself, might be where she goes looking for her mother. Um, I think that's a possibility. I think that that meeting might might happen and i think that yes it might not be completely related to what she's going through but it might give her some form of like light at the end of the tunnel or grounding that she needs i think that we're going to soon see Tyrion advance on ruby's group 
and he will he will probably become one of the more prominent antagonists of the season at least for that group if we're going with the whole route they're all separated for most of the volume i think he's going to be that their antagonist for a while but along the lines of that group as well we also have to see nora and ren's story which is also being hinted at in this past in the past episode like episode two i believe when they're in the in the destroyed town so we're gonna see something about their past and how they became orphans um weiss has to break free from her father somehow i don't know how she's going to do that my assumption is she's going to have to fight him to prove herself again like she fought the night in her trailer um blake is gonna go back to her um her home and we'll probably see her parents or her relatives i don't know if it's her parents per se but it might be. I don't know if we'll see Adam this this volume, but I'm I'm going to assume we might, considering he's featured in intro. So I feel like he's gonna probably become a prominent figure as well. Okay. So yeah, that's that's my my mess of thoughts. <laughs> Mercury, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Um, it's gonna be. Well, for one, Ren's profile picture actually finally popped up now, all of a sudden. I'm just going to point that out. But uh, for predictions, Ruby and Juniper, like Yachty said, they're going to be dealing with Tyrion for a while. And I feel like they're going to get the Mistral right as Salem's plans for destroying Haven Academy start going through, which may be connected with Tyrion as well. So, like, he's commanding the attack or whatever. Um... Weiss is going to be stuck at her home for whoever knows how long until she decides to finally get out with or without help. I'm assuming Winter, her butler, and her brother would probably help her in that. Blake, I foresee a conflict with Adam at some point popping up there, as well as Papa Belladonna and everyone else there in Menagerie. Yang is going to be very, very hard to overcome everything because, like, she can't even handle a glass being broken. So seeing her trying to fight through it all is going to be one hell of a field trip. And I think Salem is on to either Ospin somehow surviving or she knows that Crow is now taking over Ospin's work. Okay, well, uh, and last but not least, Melodic, do you have anything that you'd like to add to any of this? Yes, um, two quick things and then one more intense, uh, in-depth thing. First, I call the next Blake-centric episode Journey to the East because Sun name-dropped it. Second, kind of sweet, Yang is wearing her dad's jacket. It's got his symbol on it. And last... When you look at the opening credits, I've written about this uh, before, um, you can see that Adam is in the background, and then we see two faunus appear. One is a wolf faunus with a wolf's tail. I paused and was able to figure out there is, in fact, a wolf's tail. And the second is obviously a fox faunus. Well, there's a couple of folklore tales that are interrelated. The first is a Russian fairy tale, Sarovich Ivan, the Firebird and the Gray Wolf, where the protagonist is aided in the quest to find the Firebird with the aid of a um, wolf. The second, the Golden Bird, parallels the above story with the young protagonist seeking a golden bird aided by a fox. If, um, Raven and um, Crow's abilities as a, um, shapeshifters is because they're both faunus. We could possibly see um, Yang defest as faunus as a firebird. And I believe that at the end of season four, we will be seeing the um, that coming into um, position and that the Firebird has something religious to do with the Faunus people. Okay. All right, well, I think that's going to wrap it up for this podcast. Uh, thank you guys for joining me today. Um, for all of you guys watching, this has been the Ruby Nation podcast. 
We will be doing these weekly for each episode here on out. Um, you can catch these uh, uploaded on YouTube um, on Mondays. We're going to start uploading these on Monday night. And uh, this has been Admins Wilt, Rin, Yatsuhashi, Mercury, and Melodic Kajul. And we'll guys see you next time. You guys care. Yeah.